Since 1901, the Nobel Prizes has been presented to the Nobel laureates in ceremonies in Stockholm, 10th of December, the anniversary of the Swedish inventor Alfred Nobel's death. Although due to the corona pandemic, it's not possible this year, and therefore we are in Munich. The Nobel Prize in Physics 2020 was divided. One half awarded to Roger Penrose and the other half jointly to Reinhard Gensel and Andrea Gels. And that's the reason why we are in Munich today. Let me start by saying congratulations to the Nobel Prize. Thank you very much. It's a great, great honor for me to receive this prize from you. So before we start talking about your great achievement, could you please tell us what were you doing when you received the phone call from Stockholm about the Nobel Prize? Well, okay, I mean, it was a normal day in the life of COVID, which we, meant I was uh, starting on a, what was meant to be a seven hour Zoom conference uh, in evaluating in another institute. And, and you know how these uh, Zoom conferences are, they're primarily two dimensional uh, as we all become uh, as human beings. And then the telephone rang and uh, indeed, uh, I was absolutely unprepared uh, and certainly did not expect it. I have to say, a few years back, uh, there I did have some hopes, but then after I, I so nicely got the Crawford Prize, I thought, okay, well, that's, uh, that's what you should expect, and, and that's, that's fine. Plus, uh, uh, you know, it's remarkable that, uh, you know, so many prizes have now gone in a relatively short period of time into the astro astroparticle direction so i sh i was surely uh, not thinking that this this would be the uh... and when you hung up what was the first thing you did then <laughs> yeah well okay as i as i said i was in the is i was in this uh, committee meeting and i was not supposed to say anything okay they, they told me that's of course so i and in the in the meeting our the vice president of the max Planck society was there and i wrote i have to leave now um i apologize i have to leave now um you might want to uh, uh, check out the tv in about 15 minutes <laughs> And everyone saw, and he immediately, of course, said that, and our president knew within, within 10 minutes, too. So that was like, <laughs> ta-da. Yeah, and uh, then I went over, and uh, a number of my group had a group meeting, and I, I asked them to switch on the TV, and then we, great jubilations. Because we are a team. I mean, this is very important. Uh, and and this, this award has stimulated so many young people and also our entire institute. And uh, as you said, you are a team. You, you won this award together with Andrea Guess. And uh, could you share for our viewers a little bit about your achievement? Well, I mean, uh, you see, this, uh, from a physics point of view, is a, is a project, you might say, which is 100 years old because 100 years, actually 105 years, is when Albert Einstein published his uh, uh, general th theory of general relativity. And, and a year later, Carl Schwarzschild uh, found the first solution, which had in it already one form in the most, uh, if you like, the most uh, spherically uh, symmetric way uh, of a black hole. Okay, so this, this idea that because light uh, has to see gravity as well, if the gravity is strong enough, then even light cannot uh, uh, get out of a certain region in the vicinity of such an object. And so here, here we have 1916 and the first solution, but nobody had any idea how you possibly could find such objects. And it took 50 years until the 1960s. Then actually there was another solution found, the so-called Kerr solution, where you have objects which are rotating. But that's enough. I mean, this is the remarkable thing about black holes, uh, at least in astrophysics. They have only two properties. They have a mass and they can spin. No hills, no hair, <laughs> very simple, okay? And still the question is, are they realized in nature? And, and so that, of course, that answer can or cannot come from nature, and it did come 
in two ways. One, the X-ray astronomers found what we now know are stellar black holes in form of highly radiating X-ray bright uh, sources. And then the quasars, which are the, you know, the, what we now know are the cores of Milky Way galaxies where a lot of material is falling into the central region before, before that material disappears behind the so-called event horizon and then it's gone. Uh, in the black hole, it can get very hot and so radiate a lot. And so that was the, 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 you know, the point when astronomers started getting interested in this for the first time, really. And uh, then a number of people started thinking, now, how could we possibly prove that? And so uh, I got involved in this in, in 1980 when I was a postdoc working for a very famous Nobel laureate Charlie Towns, who got his prize for the invention of the maser and the laser, and in later years then uh, started to do astronomy. And we were beginning to work on that problem, and, and it stuck with, with us uh, to get ever better, ever, ever more detailed uh, information. And Andrea, I guess, likewise. I mean, big telescopes, uh, very complicated technology to make ever more pre precise measurements. Nowadays, uh, what we are doing, we are taking the four eight meter telescopes of the European Southern Observatory in Chile uh, as, a, as what we call an interferometer, that is we are bringing the light together from the four telescopes, thereby realizing a telescope of a 130 meter in diameter. So we can basically, we can uh, resolve on the moon a euro cent coin. And that's the kind of accuracy which is now possible. And so that's how we test uh, do, do physics tests uh, in a laboratory which you otherwise cannot get to. Yeah, it's impressive. And it's impressive also the largest telescope that you, all the new methods you had to find out to, to be able to prove this. Yes, I mean, uh, this is, a, as I said, is a long journey and many people are involved in it. And of course, uh, it's not only people, it's also the funding and the resources. And I'm very, very privileged to be part of an organization, Max Planck Society, which has what they call long trust. They trust their directors to do crazy things. <laughs> we are very grateful that you were. <laughs> and as I heard, the secretary for the Royal Swedish Academy of Scientists, Science said, this year's prize was about the darker secrets of universe. Yes. So, Thank you for sharing that. And, uh, and we were talking on the way down here from uh, the Embassy of Sweden in Berlin to Munich, uh, and the ambassador and I, uh, about black holes. And you had also a question. Well, I have my own theory. Um, we know that the universe is still expanding, but we also know that black holes will swallow everything. So at the end, won't the whole universe become again a black hole or again I don't, I don't know uh, and that would be the start of the next big bang yeah well okay actually your idea <laughs> is, is, is not as crazy as one might uh, think I'll tell you why but my dear, the first order answer is no because uh, whilst uh, every galaxy as we think now uh, has, a, has a massive black hole but one at the center its mass is about a tenth of a percent or a few tenths of, of, a, of a percent. And it can influence entire galaxies. When you feed them enough, okay, then they start spewing out uh, radiation and also material. And that happened very much so in the early universe, when, when they, as well as their host galaxies, formed together. We can do this. We can study this phenomenon in astronomy because we can do time travel, you see, real time travel. Uh, we look back in time and, and see these objects, how they were forming. Uh, so at that time, indeed, you, 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 you could say uh, big black holes could not, not, you know, not basically consume entire galaxies, but they certainly would uh, prevent further growth of, of those galaxies. Nowadays, because we are in the, the boring old age part of the universe, so to speak, things are flowing, you know, expanding uh, at a high rate and in, 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 ex in an accelerating fashion even. Uh, uh, the probability that you light up the big black holes is very low. So that, while that was very common in the early universe, it's not anymore. So the growth rates are, on average, not 
by far too small to, to do anything. But, and now come to, come, I come back to your, your idea, um, you see we have another phenomenon uh, in astronomy we call dark matter, uh, which we think actually dominates the, uh, the matter body uh, of the universe, such that our Milky Way is only about 4.5% of the amount of material which is associated with the Milky Way. And that is true for, all, for every single galaxy in the universe. And so the idea has been from the measurements we have that this is a particle, for, you know, an elementary particle which is neutral and only interacts with gravitation. Now the physicist community has been looking for that particle. Uh, we have a pretty good description uh, how the culprit should look like, okay? <laughs> uh, but we haven't found it. And so our people are beginning now to get a little desperate, actually. Uh, I mean, we definitely see the effects of, of, of dark matter, definitely, but we haven't seen the, 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 the culprit. And so one possible other alternative, other than an elementary particle, are black holes. And so that's something which people are beginning to think about. And there you get into another kind of an interesting story, which is the question of what happened before the Big Bang. I mean, I, I'm an experimentalist, very dumb experimentalist. I, I tend not to ask <laughs> questions for which I can't get any answers, okay? Uh, but it's a question, really, it is. I mean, what, what was before? Was there, was there anything? Are there other universes? And, and there are all kinds of theoretical, interesting theoretical ideas, and one of which is that uh, black holes can actually make it through Big Bangs, so to speak. But, okay. Okay, let's, let's say that's really speculation. And it will take a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> but you open Pandora's ask, is that, is that what you're thinking? No, 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 I'm saying, I'm saying is the, the dark matter issue is, is, a, is a very real issue, very much also like the accelerating universe. These are things which are in principle possible in, in the theory. I mean, so you put that into the equations of general relativity and you find solutions. But why should there be dark energy? Why should the vacuum have, have energy? Why? Who, you, who ordered that? And, and, and the dark matter, as I said, it, the, the most obvious explanation, it's a, it's, a, it's a particle which we have not seen. And why we have not seen it? Well, it just uh, doesn't interact other than with, uh, with gravity, okay? But at some level, you would like to see it in a laboratory. Yeah? It's got to be around us. And, uh, and uh, colleagues in, in deep mind uh, uh, physics haven't found it yet. And they're getting nervous. <laughs> but such is the wonder of, of the universe. And uh, I mean, I'm, of course, often asked, uh, who cares about black holes? I mean, in, in times like COVID now, uh, would it not be better you put this aside for a few years and instead uh, think about things which are relevant for humanity? There, I would say, sure, I mean, that can happen. Happens during wars. Uh, but uh, actually, the greatest progress in technology and other things often happens uh, while one is doing uh, curiosity driven research. I, mean, I mentioned Charlie Towns. Towns invented the maser and the laser, which everyone knows nowadays is a very important thing in industry, in medicine, and, and whatever else, uh, to, to look at your CDs. And, and all. But Towns was never interested in the application. Uh, what he wanted, what he needed was a lamp to look in the millimeter at molecules because he wanted to understand molecules. And if, he, if, he, if somebody would have said, well, I give you the grant, but only if you use it to, yeah? He would have said, nah, I'm not really not interested. <laughs> So talking about this, I'm curious, what made you start in this uh, area? What was the inspiration for you? Yeah, so I have, a, I have a, a very serious inheritance problem. My father was a physicist. And, and so he was, a, he was a physicist, an experimental physicist in uh, solid state physics. And so he, he very much uh, influenced me early on in, in doing experiments and, and, and the likes. Uh, and, there came, and then he was actually also a Max Planck director. So we were the, the, one of the first cases. Now there are more. Uh, and and, and 
he, it was very valuable being because I, I knew uh, how the Max Planck Society works and what it means and from, from early on. And at, at one point, then we discussed, what should I do? What, what, yeah, and, and, and he said, well, boop, boop. Uh, don't don't you don't you dare doing uh, solid state physics. Okay, that's that's how <laughs> I'm there. Uh, uh, don't do don't do particle physics. He said, but look, uh, astronomy that's interesting actually, and we are just founding a big new institute in radio astronomy in in Bonn, which uh, at that time built the biggest uh, single dish telescope in centimeter astronomy. Why don't you check that out? And so this is how I began. And as we mentioned before, it's a little bit special this year. Normally you would have traveled to Stockholm and received the award from, from uh, um, His Majesty King of Sweden. This year, uh, the Swedish ambassador Per Törsson has the honor and you also had the honor to give out the Nobel Prize in Chemistry to Professor Charpentier yesterday. So how does it feel to have the, that, this honor this year? Well, I couldn't possibly uh, replace His Majesty the King, but I, I, I tried to do my best and I must say it feels great. It really feels like, um, and I think it, especially in these times, to honor great scientists. When you look at what's happening around the world, that feels like an important statement. And I know, Professor, next year you will be in Stockholm also to do the celebrations. And yeah, well, we look I've forward to that. We've got many good friends in, in Sweden, and the, the Swedish astronomy community is very much involved in ESO, and, and so, so we, are, you know, we know each other very well. I've been many times to Sweden, and so it will be a, a pleasure to come. Well, thank you so much, and congratulations. Thank and you, uh, enjoy the evening.